So on the Lewis Nichols show today, it's one of those moments in my career where I kind of pinch in myself when I got the reply from you because arguably the greatest mind and genius in the professional wrestling business, of course, Mr. Eric Bischoff. Thank you so much for giving me uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Happy to be here, Lewis. Happy to be here. Been looking forward to this quite, quite frankly. Yeah, it's just, it's what yeah. When, when I got the reply, I kind of sent the message. Didn't expect the the reply back, and I was jumping up and down. And yeah, so <laughs> the pleasure's all mine. Um, so today I wanted to go on a bit of a journey with you, really, which is how your rest, uh, wrestling career kind of started. How did you actually get into the industry? Was it something you loved growing up as a kid? I, I did. You know, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I'm uh, 65 years old uh, now, so. Uh, or it will be soon, <clears throat> at the end of this month. So I'm, I'm basically, I'm a, I'm, I'm a product of the, the 50s, but really the 60s in terms of the yeah. things that influenced me. And believe it or not, you're far too young to remember, and your parents may understand this, but back in the 60s, television was still kind of new. Um, in the part of Detroit that I grew up in, um, most people only had one television, they didn't have two or three. Most people only had black and white television. They didn't have color. <laughs> I, I remember the very first color television set in my neighborhood. It was like, whoa, this is so crazy. Um, but television really was a centerpiece of family life. You know, there were only three television networks and maybe an independent, local independent station available. This was before cable and VCRs and DVRs and TiVo and streaming and all of that. So entertainment was really um, very much a family affair and al almost like eating dinner. In fact, you know, an entire industry called TV dinners um, was created around the fact that people, you know, families kind of communed around, you know, television. And as a result of being so influenced by television as a young kid, um, I grew up watching you know, here in the States, you know, Saturday mornings, you know, between seven in the morning and noon was a, a kid's block, meaning programming that was really designed for, you know, younger kids up to the ages of about 14, 15, 16 years old. So you'd start out with cartoons, animated shows. And then as the morning got later, you'd start getting into uh, more live type shows. Like the big one when I was a kid was Sky King about a, uh, a, a local guy rancher who happened to have his own plane and was always involved in some kind of an adventure that always included his airplane love that show probably influenced me to later on in life get my pilot's license you know wow. 30 or 40, 40 years later and the last show that would come on in that saturday morning block was professional wrestling now here's the cool thing about it um my my both my mother well my father worked my mother didn't but we only had one car. So on Saturday mornings, my mother would drive my father to the office to work, and then she would take the car and go grocery shopping for the week. Which means that my brother and I, who's a couple years younger than me, were left at home and we had the house to ourselves. We had control over the television. We could raid the refrigerator. We could eat all <laughs> of the Cocoa Puff cereal we wanted to eat. Right? <laughs> We're freedom, like Mel Gibson, you know, freedom every Saturday morning. And I would always end my day watching professional wrestling. And then when the show was over, my brother and I, Mark, would kind of reenact, you know, the, the physicality that we had watched um, on, on professional wrestling. So I grew up, you know, being, being a fan and being influenced, and it, it stuck with me really throughout my life. So then how did that journey from you like it? Because I know um, you have a martial arts background as well. So how did the journey of you actually working in wrestling come about? Was that something by chance? Because I, I remember when I've seen something before, I thought it was to do with advertising that kind of got you into to wrestling. Uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, in, it would take us several hours to really get into all the details, but I'll kind of summarize it for you. Once I, you know, I, I, got, I moved around the United States. We moved from Detroit to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh to Minneapolis. And when I was about 14 or 15 years old and everywhere along the way, I continued, you know, to watch professional wrestling. And then as I got into my teens and my early 20s, obviously I, I got busy with other things. <laughs> um, 
and and kind of stepped away from wrestling for the most part. Uh, and I got heavily involved in martial arts. <clears throat> I was always I always liked contact type of sports. I was too small really to play football. Uh, basketball didn't interest me, but I loved you know amateur wrestling. So I was a I started out amateur wrestling when I was about thirteen years old, I guess, or fourteen and kind of stuck through it all through high school and uh, even into college. Once my amateur wrestling career was over, I was, I was missing that contact and competitive opportunities. So I, I had always been interested in martial arts. So I, I got really interested in it and kind of threw myself into it and got my black belt in martial arts and kind of fought competitively around the United States and things like that. But the important part of the story is that during that period of time, I met a guy by the name of Sonny Ono, who oh, yeah. wrestling fans may recognize Sonny. Sonny was also a martial artist and a very good one. <clears throat> and uh, Sonny and I first met traveling around the United States at these different martial arts competitions. This was before MMA, of course. Uh, they used to call it PKA, or Professional Kickboxing Association. And that's where I really got to know Sonny. And one night um, after a, an event that we were both at, of course, we were sitting down in a bar, probably chasing women or whatever <laughs> and sitting there and having a couple of beers and, and Sonny's almost exactly the same age as I am and I asked Sonny and he grew up in Tokyo and I grew up in Detroit so the conversation started out talking about our respective childhoods and how different they were because of the cultures that we lived in and the way we grew up but yet in many respects how similar they were in terms of the way we kind of entertained ourselves. He grew up in a similar kind of economic environment that I did. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and, you know, we were kind of forced to entertain ourselves. So we started comparing notes and fast forward, cause it can get really long. By the end of the night, after copious amounts of, of beer, um, we had this game sketched out on these bar napkins called Ninja Star Wars. And in, in essence, what it was, was, you know, if you and I were playing, you would put this kind of felt vest over you that would tie around the sides and had a ninja warrior kind of silk screen on the front. And then a little headband that would go around your head like Karate Kid style. And there was a real thin piece of plastic that would come down and protect your eyes. And then in each game, you'd get three red stars. And these red stars were kind of about that big around and they were weighted down in the middle and they were Velcro on the outside. So if you threw one at me and you hit me, it would stick to my vest, right? And the first person to get all three stars on the vest won the game, simple game. So we decided we were gonna make a fortune with this game. And we begged, borrowed, stole every nickel we could, had about 5,000 of them manufactured in Korea, had them shipped over to the United States because we were absolutely convinced that we were gonna become multimillionaires based on the success of this game. And this was the, the movie Karate Kid was real popular, I think, around that time yeah. or whatever. So we were convinced. We, we had it made. Our future was, you know, bright and everything was, we were set for life. Until we had to figure out how to actually sell these games. We hadn't figured that part out. We had 5,000 of them, <laughs> but we didn't know how to get them to market. So living in Minneapolis at the time and growing up as a wrestling fan of the AWA, which was owned and, and, and run by a guy by the name of Vern Gagne, who is also an amateur wrestler. That's an important part of this journey and the story. Vern Gagne was a very big supporter of amateur wrestling. And I had met Vern um, several times as an amateur wrestler. And I thought, wait a minute, I watch the AWA every Monday through Friday on ESPN from three o'clock to four o'clock central time. I know that Vern Gagne is a big supporter of amateur wrestling. I was an amateur wrestler, right in the same school yeah. district that, that he was when you know back in the 40s or whatever, 30s. So I thought, I'll just reach out to Vern and see if he'd be interested in promoting these games with me. And I did, and he was. <laughs> and within about a, a month after first meeting Vern, he hired me to come and work for his wrestling promotion in sales and syndication. So that's the truncated version of how I got into professional wrestling. You seem like someone who would, because you were just talking about that game, and I kind of, if that was on Amazon right now, I'd be going on to buy it. So you can tell how sales is, is something that you're strung at, because that's something that I want to get for myself. 
Yeah, well, for me, I, you know, I, I, I've always been a salesman, you know, at the yeah. core of everything I've done. It's always really been about sales, as is so much in life is, really. You know, what is, what is sales? Sales is just trying to communicate your passion and your ideas and convince someone else that, you know, they should be equally as passionate uh, about whatever it is you are. It's really just life to me, but I, one of the things I've always been fairly decent at when I felt passionate about what I was representing yeah. is, is selling. So yeah, it's always been kind of at the core of everything I do, if I'm passionate about it. And you mentioned Vern uh, just a little bit there. And if people watch various documentaries on you and interviews uh, from you, that's, he was someone that you had a lot of respect for and you were very loyal to him as well. I, I understand that you actually still worked for him despite not getting paid all the time. So what was it about Vern that you really kind of just took to and had, where did that respect come from? Um, you know, I don't know for certain, I guess, when I think back, you know, it's, I, I've never really analyzed why I like or respect certain people too much. I either do or I don't. If I don't, yeah. I don't think about it too much. And if I do, I don't think about it a whole lot. But, um, you know, with Vern, number one, uh, he gave me my first job in pro professional wrestling at a time when no one else would, honestly. I wasn't qualified for the position. Um, and, and being in the financial situation that Vern was in when he hired me, um, he didn't have a lot of staff. So I had the ability to learn a lot of different aspects of the business that I was really not qualified for. But because there was no one else around and somebody needed to do the work, they taught me. So, you know, I started out learning sales and syndication, which is basically advertising sales in a nutshell. And then I was able to promote some of my own events. And then I learned production. I learned how to edit. I learned how the whole process came together, which really fascinated me, by the way. Because as a kid, as a product of the 60s, television was like, you know, I, I, I use this parallel all the time. Um, it's a little bit like a microwave oven today. Everybody has one, but nobody can tell you how it works, right? Yeah. You just put your food in it, push a couple buttons, and it comes out hot. Well, nobody knows why. And I felt the same way about television, you know, growing up as a kid. It was just magic box and had all this great entertainment in it, but I had no clue how it all actually came together. So having the opportunity to, on a very fundamental level, learn that process was something I was very grateful for. And then later on, out of sheer necessity, um, I became an on-camera talent. And shortly after that, I was working for Ted Turner at, Ted, at Turner Broadcasting. So I guess the respect I have for Vern to this day is probably a reflection of the opportunities that he gave yeah. me and how grateful I am to this day for those opportunities. Now, I know it's a, a jump, but going to uh, WCW, you know, we all know you for, for what you did. Um, and you kind of done the um, unimaginable with the success of WCW. But starting off, I know you were a, a commentator um, and, and you did that kind of on-screen stuff. And you had the look as well. You had the, the hair was always on point. You just looked good on camera. I know my um, hair still looks pretty damn good, doesn't it? it? I couldn't believe it when you said, um, it, you know, it's your birthday and you're, you're in your 60s. You look incredible. You look well, the thank same. You. I, I, yeah. I feel incredible. You, you, you've not aged. You need, yeah, you need to um, launch your secrets to looking good. But I mean, going back to, to that, you were an on-screen talent, and I guess no one would ever have thought you would have got the position that you did. You know, from including me, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> including me. I was. No one was more surprised than I was. <laughs> So when you were there, you obviously, you spoke about just a minute ago, you love to know everything about the business, you know, so you like to know how everything works. So when the job became available, what made you think, do you know what, I'm going to apply for this? Did you just have a feeling that you could do as good as anyone else could? You know, what, what made you apply for it? I think there were really two, two or three things going on in my mind at the time. You know, number one, I was ready to walk away from WCW. Um, prior to the opportunity to kind of throw my hat in the ring and, and take a, a run at becoming the executive producer uh, after Bill Watts left or was fired. Uh, I, prior to that, you know, I didn't enjoy working for Bill Watts. I didn't have any faith in him uh, that he was going to be able to turn WCW around because WCW was never made money. WCW was a money loser for Turner Broadcasting from the day they purchased it. It was just a question of how much money they lost. 
And when Bill Watts came in with much fanfare and expectation, um, he actually made things a lot worse in many, many different ways. And during that period of time, I made up my mind that, now I had been with WCW for a while, and I had made up my mind that I was going to go to Los Angeles and try to uh, essentially, you know, develop my own production company and kind of step out of wrestling. So, and right about the time I was ready to make that transition, Bill Watts got fired and Turner Broadcasting Management, a gentleman by the name of Bill Shaw, took over WCW and said that the company was going to be looking for an executive producer that was not a wrestling guy meaning not a former professional wrestler uh, because the WCW's experience with former professional wrestlers turned executives had a very bad track record ending with Bill, ending with Bill Watts. So they were going to reach outside and look for somebody that had a television, television experience, um, a sales and marketing background, an advertising background, uh, a general entertainment background, that understood wrestling, but wasn't a wrestling guy, meaning ex-professional wrestler. And I thought, wait a minute, man, stretching it a little bit in a couple of those categories, but it's kind of me. Yeah. And, and I was already on my way out the door anyway, so I felt like, what do I have to lose? I might as well put my name in the hat and see if they pull it. You know, I got nothing to lose. And I did. And then they hired me, to your point. No one was more surprised than me. <laughs> you know, I, I actually got the gig. And were there any kind of wrestlers or backstage personnel that were so annoyed that you had got the job that they had left? Was there anybody that was kind of like, really? You know, what's this about? So you um, not wrestlers. You know, wrestlers, as long as the checks keep coming every two weeks, they're happy. So they didn't really care. Um, I, mean, I mean, there were plenty of them, I thought, that were – they thought they went from – bad in Bill Watts to worse with me because nobody thought, and they were right, by the way. I, I, I don't blame them for feeling the way they felt, but it was like, wait a minute, this guy is a third string backup announcer and now he's running the company? That makes no sense. I get that, you know, and I understood it then. Um, that was a general, I think, consensus. Yeah. You know, to my face, of course, people were very supportive and all that, but, you know, within the office, but they had to be because I was the new boss, right? Yeah, of course. Not that, they really, <laughs> not that they really believed any of the things that they said to me uh, were true, but they had to put on a good good front. <clears throat> but, um, no, nobody, you know, no, nobody uh, abandoned ship, so to speak, or tried to create a mutiny, at least not right away. Now, WCW was struggling to, to get an audience at live shows. It just wasn't working. And like you mentioned, money was being lost. You, you say you've got this job now. How do you know where to even begin? Because you must be writing things down, right? We need to do this, this, and this. And before you know it, you've got 100 jobs that need to be done. So for you, what was the main focus that you thought, if we start with this and master that, we're going we're gonna to go somewhere? Well, as I said, you know, WCW had been losing millions of dollars every year from the time that it became WCW <clears throat> prior to me getting there. It was just a question of how many millions that they were losing. Yeah. So having been an employee and having been kind of a fly on the wall, I, I saw a lot of waste. I saw a lot of things that were just from a basic organizational point of view, wasteful spending, for example. I mean, I'll give you one example in particular. Um, all of the talent, most of the talent, so many people, including myself. When I first got hired by WCW, I lived in Minneapolis. And they would fly me to Atlanta once a week to do all of my post-production work. And then they would fly me home, usually two days later. Well, oftentimes my schedule in Atlanta <clears throat> would change after they had already sent me a ticket. Now, this was before the internet. This was before <clears throat> airline ticketing got very sophisticated and computerized and all that. So you got to remember that context is king, right? So this was back in the early 90s. So for example, if I was scheduled on, on the previous Tuesday to fly in the following Monday <clears throat> to Atlanta, they would send me a ticket, a hard ticket. They wouldn't email it to me. This is before email. So they would express mail or whatever, a hard ticket that was in my name, airline ticket. Yeah. And my ticket was generally worth at the time probably seven to $800 round trip each way. 
<clears throat> every week. Now, if say on Thursday, prior week Thursday, the schedule would change for some reason and they didn't need, need me to come in until Tuesday, they would send me a new ticket. Now I had two tickets. I always save my tickets and turn them in, the unused ticket. But a lot of the talent, and I was fully aware of this because they would brag about it to me when I was kind of innocuous and a fly on the wall, third string announcer kind of guy. They, you know, there was one wrestler in particular, one talent in particular, that would come up and he had a stack of unused tickets, three or four inches thick, that were was probably worth anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars wow he didn't turn those tickets in he kept them because back then as long as the ticket was issued in your name it didn't matter who paid for it that was your ticket and you yeah. could exchange it you could apply it to your own personal travel you could use it for a friend you do anything you wanted to it was almost as good as cash you couldn't buy a pizza or, be, or buy a pint with it but you could do a lot of other things with it so one of the first things i did was start you know, recognizing all of the, that wasteful kind of expenditures. And my first goal was really to eliminate that. In other words, to start saving money where I knew the company was losing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Then started looking at, you know, how can we produce our shows more cost efficiently? How can we increase the production level, but yet take advantage of, uh, of scale, so to speak, and find ways to produce the shows for less money. Again, saving money was always at the core, or at least the first couple of years, while trying to find ways to improve the overall production quality of the show. <clears throat> so the first couple, it's why we moved the shows to the Disney MGM Studios for, for a while, because it, it, it allowed us to take advantage of the economies of scale that come along with producing your show in a soundstage. So there were a lot of things like that that I focused on at the beginning, and then once those things started to balance things out a little bit and we were getting closer to actually making a profit for the first time ever in WCW, then I was allowed to start adding expenses to bring in better talent and bigger name talent and do a better job marketing and promotion and that type of thing. And of course, I think, and it's still to this day, I mean, you know, you probably spoke about it numerous times in interviews. It's a celebrated moment was of course Hulk Hogan going over to WCW. It was just one of those moments where everyone was kind of stopped and thought, really, is this happening? And you never forget the moment of him going, um, you know, in the car and you've got Jimmy Hart there. It was, everything was just so special about it. So how did that actually come about? And when you set out to get Hogan, did you think you were going to get him? Um, well, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know if I, we, we would be able to come to terms or not. I had hoped, obviously, or I would have made the attempt. Yeah. Uh, how it came about, you know, Hulk had left WWE, you know, at the end of the steroid trial, if you remember that, or actually while it was still going on. Hulk had pretty much, at that point in his life, he really believed he was done with wrestling. He was at the Disney MGM Studios, the same place I was producing my show, Hulk was there producing a syndicated show called Thunder, of Par Thunder in Paradise, which was by, produced by the same producers that were producing Baywatch at the time. So it was a pretty big, pretty big deal. And Hulk was, you know, on the same set or soundstage as I was, or excuse me, the same lot as I was. And, you know, Ric Flair, for example, who was working with me in WCW, obviously knew Hulk and was able to set up the first meeting. We just started talking and... It all worked out pretty well, and the rest is history. And there, of course, it, everyone else kind of jumped over. And I guess if you're Vince McMahon, you're just kind of putting your hands in your head. And for you, you can go backstage and, you know, with all the executives and kind of, you're, you're doing your job. You're proven they were right to, to put you in charge because the biggest names at this promotion that were getting the ratings are now coming over to you. And I guess that's kind of where WCW were looked at then as competition. They weren't just a, a small promotion. They really were up that level with, with WWE. So when you were getting all these big names, did you know that now you were at war with WWE for, for ratings? No because, it, no, because it didn't happen right away. You know, Hulk came in 1994, I believe, in July yeah. of 1994. Uh, things didn't really turn around for us until almost over a year later when the opportunity to produce Nitro happened in September, I believe, of 95. So almost a year and a half 
had gone by while well, we still had Hulk, we had Randy Savage, you know, we had Sting, we had Ric Flair. But as a company, as a television platform, you know, we weren't in prime time. We were on the smaller of the two Turner networks, TNT being the larger of the two, or the, I, I guess, the hood ornament, if you will, the, the, the network that was considered the prestige network. Uh, we weren't there. So when the idea or the opportunity to launch Nitro came and we had Hogan and we had Savage and ultimately Piper and Hall and Nash and everybody else that came along with it, <clears throat> that head-to-head -head battle between Monday Night Raw and Monday Night Nitro is where I felt like we were truly competition. Up until that point, we were still a distant number two in all fairness and transparency. And, you know, we, we weren't really competitive. We had some big names but we just didn't have a show because we weren't in prime time that was anywhere remotely equal to Monday Night Raw on USA Network. <clears throat> and I think what was nice about what you were doing is you were offering for fans and the audience something different because I, I feel back then WWE was stuck in that kind of gimmicky side of wrestling. You know, everyone was a character essentially where you brought this element of real life. There was, it was something special. As, as soon as you would watch Nitro, there was just a different feel about it. So was that always your intention? Was there, was there a moment where you kind of looked at that product and thought, what can I do differently? You know, how, how well, did that happen? That's exactly what I did. You know, the, and you know, people that follow me or read my book or hear me in interviews know that, you know, going head to head with Monday Night Raw was not my idea. That was Ted Turner's idea. He more or less just said, go do this. And, I knew my only choice, I was going to do one of two things. I was either going to fail, which means WCW was going to fail again, or I was going to succeed. And in which case my equity as an executive in Turner Broadcasting was going to go through the roof. So I only had two choices, fail or succeed. I thought, okay, I have to succeed. So how can I do that? And I literally, to your, your observation, I, locked myself in my office alone with a legal pad and, and a pencil. And I said, okay, I need to be different than the WWE. I can't be better than the WWE at what the WWE did. I did WWE was a, a television show that was really geared towards kids, six to 12 years old, probably six to 14 years old, was their core audience because that's where all of their licensing and their merchandising and their ad sales was all targeted towards children. So as a result, their, their presentation, their characters, their storylines, everything about it was very cartoonish. And that worked for them for a long time. And I knew I couldn't be better at that than WWE was. So by default, I had to do something different. And that's when I kind of started really thinking about a more reality-based presentation, less, you know, garbage men, crazy dentists, mean lawyers, IRS agents, clowns, you know, all of the crazy things that, you know, really WWE was using at the time. Um, I went the uh, exact opposite and started, not completely, but started integrating more reality-based storytelling that was more relatable to 18 to 49-year-old males. Uh, and introducing characters that were more true to life characters, yeah. again, as opposed to over the top garbage men and, you know, Paul Bearers and Undertakers and Duke the Dumpster Drozies and Doink the Clowns and Irvin Scheister, the IRS, and all those crazy kind of cartoony characters. I went the other way and targeted a different audience and it, it worked. I mean, for, as an observation from a fan's perspective, it felt like, and I think it was really clever to do, was you allowed the wrestler to kind of be themselves, but turned up. So it was kind of true to themselves. And I think that's why they, they played it so well, because it's real life, essentially. Well, and, and, and there was, you know, there was, there were, there were a lot of influences on me that helped me to arrive at that strategy yeah. or those tactics. You know, one of them was, and I remember working for Vern Gagne, and when he was finally kind of, I'm going to say mentoring, but that makes it sound a little bit too, um, a, little, a little more than it really was. But one of the things that Vern taught me 
particularly when he was training me and teaching me how to become a play-by-play -play announcer, is the art in, in professional wrestling is allowing the audience to forget what they're watching isn't real. Well, that's the same thing as being a decent actor, right? Yeah. If you go to a if you go to a feature film, and you're watching this feature film, and you see a microphone come down from the top into the frame, that takes you out of the moment because that's reminding you that none of this is real. But if the acting is great, if the music, you know, the score is great, if the the backdrop, if all of the elements that make a great movie a great movie. Are, are where they should be, as an audience member, you forget that you're watching a movie and you allow yourself to get emotionally invested. It'll either make you laugh if it's a comedy, it'll make you cry if it's a sad movie, um, it, it'll create you know, all of the emotion that comes with a great drama if it's a dramatic feature. Um, so all of that is just allowing the audience to forget what they're watching isn't real. And that has always, to this day, stuck with me, uh, sometimes too much, and I, I get too critical of things. But um, that was another thing that kind of drove me towards the more reality-based storylines. Is And that's why the MWO storyline worked, because there was a plausibility in it. You know, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash yeah. had previously worked at WCW, and they were frustrated. And, they weren't getting the money they thought they deserved. They weren't getting the opportunities they felt they deserved. They believed that they were bigger stars than they were being recognized as. So they left and they went to the WWF where they became big stars. And now, this is where the story comes in, they were, they were coming back to WCW to get revenge on all of the people that didn't give them the credit that they deserved the first time around. That was the premise of the NWO story. Well, the reason it worked is because everything I described to you that had happened in the past was actually true. Yeah. It actually happened. And wrestling fans do it. Therefore, if the premise of a story is believable, that's 75% of the battle. Because you've now now you're now you're presenting a story based on truth and for the most part, common knowledge. And and those who weren't knowledgeable of it would go, well, yeah, I, well, yeah, that probably did happen. Okay, I, I buy that. And so that once I saw that come together and I experienced it, I went, okay, we need, to, we need to put more talent in positions where they're not trying to be actors because wrestlers are performers. Some of them, you know, cat named The Rock, for example, you know, now John Cena, Dave Bautista to a degree, um, have emerged as you know bona fide Hollywood actors, uh, but the vast majority of wrestling talent, particularly the talent that I had on my roster, they, they were great wrestlers and they were great performers within the context of a professional wrestler, but they weren't great actors, meaning they couldn't take a character that was written down on a piece of paper and become that character. But what you could do is find the elements of their true personalities that you could turn into a character simply by turning up the volume yeah. and exaggerating those characteristics and building a story around that. And that was the approach that I took. And that was, I mean, describing that the Kevin Nash and Scott Hall moment, it was just, no one could believe what they were watching. It was kind of like, wait there, they were just on this show. They're hit, like, no one knew what was going on. So when you approached Scott and Kevin, um, with the early conversations, was it always, was it ever just about money or did they like the direction that you were taking WCW? What was their kind of reason for the jumping chip, do you think? Well, obviously, anytime you acquire, you know, top talent, money is the first thing that yeah. you talk about. Um, but once you get through that, then money is no longer a topic of conversation. Not, not, not for a while anyway. No. Um, so, no, we didn't talk a lot about money. And truth be known... I didn't share where I was going, but when I brought in Scott and Kevin, I didn't tell them initially about the NWO idea. I didn't tell them about my vision for them. I didn't share it with them because number one, I didn't know either one of them very well. I knew them, but I didn't know them well. And there's a, there's a saying in, in the professional wrestling business, telephone, telegraph, tell a wrestler. And it was important to me that I keep the storyline very um, 
secret and not let it get out there in the dirt sheets. This is before the internet, really. Not let it get out there in the nascent stages of the internet or in dirt sheets and have people criticizing it before they even saw it. So I kept it to myself. So there was very little real discussion about creative direction with Scott or Kevin when they first came in. Uh, for them, I think it was just, a, it was a financial deal for them. It was transactional. You know, they wanted to make close to the same amount of money they were making in WWE for less dates. Well, I could offer that to them. So we really didn't talk a whole lot about creative in the first six or seven months of, of, of them being back in WCW. Now, with the NWO, for me personally, that's where I became a big Eric Bischoff fan because I just love the the brashness, the, the ability to wind anybody up. You could go into that ring on the microphone and then you just had this ability to get a reaction, to create a buzz. Everything you did was was talked about. You know, it was talked about. And I, if Twitter and Facebook was a thing back then, I think you would have been trending every single show because you had the, the shock factor. So... Did you enjoy getting to be that kind of creative side and actually show that on-screen personality that you have in abundance? Of course I did. You know, I'm, I, I, I am a performer. You know, I love to perform um, f from a, a, on a personal level. It's enjoyable to me. But on the creative side, the producer side of me really got, you know, a rush because I was able to take these ideas that I had in my head and manifest them either on paper for somebody else, or in my case, as a character, I could get into the ring and I could be this character that I knew was getting the reaction that we desperately needed. Um, and that's a very, it's a very powerful feeling. It's a very gratifying feeling to be able to have 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 people, more or less in the palm of your hand and be able to manipulate them with the things you do and the things you say to get the reaction you need exactly when you need it so that when the baby face comes in or the, the, the protagonist or the good guy, whatever you want to call him, comes into the scene, then he or she gets the reaction that you want them to get. It's kind of like, being the captain of, the, I was like the, I felt like the Captain Kirk of wrestling, man. I could make my starship do anything I wanted it to do. <laughs> Damn the Klingons, I could care less. I had the ability to kind of create the environment with a character and a microphone that made it all come together and work. And it wasn't just me, obviously. I was a part of that, but I was a, you know, a, a very visible part of that for a period of time. Now, looking back now, it, it was obviously the right, thing to do because I can't think of NWO without Hulk Hogan but at the time he is always traditionally know, uh, known as this kind of superhero face and then to see him as a heel was like hang on a minute no one knew what to think because we've always associated Hulk Hogan as this kind of American superhero good guy always going to look after you and then you came up and, and made him a heel so why did you t uh, decide to turn him to, to a heel? Well um the fact is that it wasn't him. Hulk Hogan as a baby face wasn't working. And, and he knew it. Hulk knew it. We all knew it. Nobody really wanted to talk about it. Right. Yeah. But it was true. Hulk wasn't getting the reactions that he was getting five or six or seven or eight years earlier. Um, the ratings weren't really moving in the direction that he hoped they would, or certainly we hoped they would. Um, so everybody was aware of it, but nobody really knew how to address it. And I, you know, I, it's funny, you know, that Hulk Hogan turning heel was really a 12 month journey within a journey. You know, I, I went down a year before the NWL, a year well in advance. I went down to Florida to talk to Hulk about you know, the fact that maybe he should think about turning heel. And he didn't want to have, he didn't want to have the conversation. He was very polite about it. He was elegant and, you know, a good friend during the course of the conversation, but he made it very clear uh, when he said, and in fact, his exact words to me were, Eric, until you walk a, a mile in my red and yellow boots, you'll never really get it. And then he looked at his watch and said, brother, I got to go to, pick up my kids at school. Thanks for coming by. 
which is a very nice way of throwing me out of his house. So that was then, and he went off to go do a movie uh, because we were only doing four pay-per-views a year with Hulk at the time. So he had some downtime between pay-per-views and he went off to do a movie in Hollywood. And he called in, in 96 when he saw Scott Hall come in and come through the crowd and, you know, kind of tell us what's up. And then the following week, Kevin Nash showed up and said, we've got a third man and he's a surprise. Right about the time Hulk saw that, he called me and said, hey, can you come out to LA? I can't leave the movie set, but can you come out to LA? I'd like to talk to you. So I did and went out to the set and we, we, we sat in his movie trailer. I remember I got there late at night. It was like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I've been traveling all day from Atlanta <clears throat> and sitting in his movie trailer and he had a case of beer, and a box of Cuban cigars, and we were imbibing in both. And he sat back and he said, so, brother, who's going to be the third man? And I thought to myself, telephone, telegraph, telerestor. I, I didn't want to tell him because I didn't want it to, not that he would, divulge it intentionally, but I didn't want, I just didn't want, if there was somebody standing outside the door, I didn't want them to hear, yeah. right? I was that worried about that, and justifiably. So I said, well, I don't know, Hulk. Who do you think it should be? <laughs> You're looking at him, brother. I went, whoa, <laughs> that's awesome. So it took me a year, it took him a year, to, to kind of see, and and I think more than seeing it, because he always knew it wasn't working as well as he wanted it to, uh, but he was looking, you know, Hulk's a very smart guy, and he was looking for that right opportunity. He didn't want to turn heel just for the sake of turning heel out of desperation <clears throat> because the baby face thing wasn't working any longer, and he was right about that. You don't want to do something just for the sake of doing it because what you're doing isn't working. You want to do something like that because you've got a really great plan. And when I laid it all out to Hall, after he volunteered for, for that role, because it was going to be Sting, by the way, um, once he stepped forward and said, it should, it should be me, brother, I went, okay, now we've got something completely different. Not that Sting was bad. Sting was a good choice. Hulk Hogan was a great choice. So once that, once he threw his name in a the hat, then we started talking about it. And shortly thereafter, there he was. Probably a month and a half later, he was the heel Hulk Hogan. Got to say, that's probably the best Hulk Hogan impression I've ever heard. So I've got to Hulk's, mention that. Hulk's, Hulk's kind of easy. What real easy, what a really savage brother. That's really, <laughs> really easy. That's brilliant. And, you know, just on the point of you turning <coughs> Hulk Hogan heel, uh, you, I mean, you would have seen it yourself. You get people in interviews at time that will say about you and WCW that you didn't have the ability to create new stars. You always had to have people that would come in. And, and that kind of proves that that was wrong because you took someone that, yeah, okay, is established, but it wasn't working. And it was you that came up with an idea that probably a lot of people wouldn't have thought of doing uh, and making him a heel. So... You know, what are your thoughts on people that say that you didn't have the ability to create new characters? Oh, I think there's some, some truth to that. Keep in mind, I didn't get involved in the creative process of WCW until really late 95 and probably more accurately, 96. So my window of creating stars was really about a 20, well, we'll call it a 36 month, 24 months to 36 month window. And, you know, during that period of time, let's talk, you know, Hulk Hogan was Hulk Hogan before he came to WCW, <clears throat> but Hulk Hogan was Hulk Hogan before he got to the WWF. Vern Gagne made Hulk Hogan a big star in the AWA. The Rocky movie made Hulk Hogan a big star before he came back to WWE. <clears throat> so in essence, Hulk Hogan was a star that was created somewhere else that made it to WWE and then came to WCW. <clears throat> Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, as we previously discussed, were stars, they weren't big stars, but they were top level performers at WCW who went to the WWF, who became bigger stars 
They weren't created from scratch. Their characters were, but they were already pretty well established. And then Vince McMahon successfully created Diesel and Razor Ramon, which really elevated them. Well, guess what happened when they came back to WCW? I recreated them and they became even bigger stars than they were when they were in WWF. So I guess if, if you want to be cynical, if you have an agenda or if you have a point of view that wants to say, you know, Eric Bischoff really wasn't all that successful or WCW wasn't really all that successful because he didn't really create any stars. There is an argument to be had, but it's not a fair argument. You know, it, I had two years. So let's just take Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. To this day, when you see them in comic, at Comic-Con anywhere in the UK, they're not there as Diesel or Razor Ramon. They're there in their NWO outfit. Right. Oh, and by the way, the NWO merchandise outsells. <clears throat> I'll be careful how I say this. It is one of the top selling items currently, currently, 20 some odd years later in the WWE catalog compared to all of the current WWE merchandise. Who created that? <laughs> um, cool. That was 20 years ago. Yeah. And now you add, oh, I don't know, Bill Goldberg into the mix, yeah. who. You know, last year made over three or four million dollars in the WWE, according to reports, and is still a, considered a big star. Where did he come from? Um, you look at all of the cruiserweights who went on to become, yes, arguably bigger stars, but who created them? I didn't. I didn't invent them out of dust. I mean, they were working in other places before they came to me, but they certainly didn't have a national platform. They certainly were getting. Um, they were certainly getting, not getting prime time international exposure before they came to me. Creating the cruiserweight division created Chris Jericho. It was the platform that Chris Jericho was able to, to launch his career from because he, we made him a bigger star. Same could be true for, uh, say, same could be said for Rey Mysterio. So yeah. there were a, there were a lot of talents that people forget were, you know, they weren't created from a sketch pad but they were certainly created as stars in WCW and on Nitro before they got the opportunity to go to WWE. And just going a little bit back to the NWO, um, there was a stage where a lot more members would be added. Um, and it got to a stage where pretty much a, a good chunk of the roster ended up being in the NWO briefly or, or for a, a period of time. Looking back, do you regret how many people actually uh, you know, got into the NWO? Do you wish you had kept it to a minimum? I, well, yes and no. You know, 2020 hindsight's always an incredibly valuable tool for looking backwards. So with, with 2020 hindsight, of course. But again, <clears throat> context is king. And if you listen to my yeah. podcast, 83 Weeks, uh, I, re I make that statement all the time because people tend to forget when they look at, you know, the last 20 years of wrestling as a whole, oftentimes they make comparisons or trying to draw parallels and analogies out of context. So with context in mind, keeping in mind the goal, you know, why? Why did we add so many people to the NWO? Not just because it was fun, not just because it was easy, although in some cases it was both, in some cases not so much, but for the most part, uh, it was working and it was easy, but that's not why we did it. We did it because the intent the strategy that we had in mind was to create an NWO that was so large that it would take over Nitro and WCW would take over Thunder on TBS and we would have two companies battling it out for supremacy under one corporate umbrella. So in order to build the WW, or excuse me, the NWO roster big enough so that they had enough people on a two-hour show to sustain a two-hour show and tell stories and all the other things, we had to increase the size of that roster. Now, unfortunately, in, 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 in context in its totality, we never got to finish the job. Yeah. Things happened right about the time that the NWO was getting big enough. There were a lot of, you know, internal influences and corporate influences that kind of turned our creative more or less upside down, screwed up our budgets quite, quite badly. Um, a lot of things happened and, and I'll, you know, I'll take some of it was my own, um, 
failure as an executive and as a creator to kind of keep it all together and make it happen, regardless of the challenges and the circumstances. Things really began to unravel, you know, in 98, starting in 98, and really got bad in 99. So the original intent of creating these two separate brands was really undermined, partly my fault, my failure, but also in an equal part, if not a larger part, by a lot of internal influences that was really out of our control. Now, obviously, the NWO, a massive part of you, you know, something you come up with and, and brought this to our attention. And last year it was announced, um, or it might be you know, earlier this year, that they were going to be entered into the WWE Hall of Fame. Now, for me, just as a fan's uh, point of view, I don't understand why it wasn't Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and you. That's what I would envision going into the Hall of Fame. So when you found out the news of the lineup that were going in, what were your thoughts? Did you feel that you should be included? Did you understand why x Pac was in there? What kind of is your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I didn't react nearly as much as I guess many people thought I would or should. Um, I, I look at things differently. You know, if, if you were to come to my home, uh, I have a sizable home, 5,000 square foot, not bragging, but I've got a lot of wall space in my house, right? In fact, you can see I'm in my office yeah. upstairs. There's, there's hardly anything on the walls up here, right? I have no memorabilia. I don't, I don't have pictures of myself and things that represent, you know, parts of my career. I, I, don't, I don't have any of that. There's not one piece of wrestling memorabilia. I'll take that back. There's one or two things out of the storage unit. But there's nothing in my house that if you didn't know me, you wouldn't come into my house and go, oh, he must have been in the wrestling business. Oh, there's a picture of him in Hulk Hogan. Oh, there's a picture of him and Dennis Robin. Oh, there's Shaquille O'Neal. There's Ric Flair. There's Roddy Piper. Nothing, right? I, I, I loved my time in the industry while I had it. I am so grateful for it. I can't articulate it sufficiently. But I don't hang on to things. I, so when, when it was announced, I was, I was happy for my friends. I'm, you know, Hulk Hogan is my best friend to this day. Scott Hall is still a great friend of mine. Kevin Nash is a good friend of mine. Sean Waltman is a good friend of mine. So my initial reaction was, God, good for them. And my second reaction, probably at about the same time, simultaneously, was, all right, they're finally recognizing the NWO which in yeah. my opinion, if it wouldn't have been for the NWL, there wouldn't have been an attitude era. If there wouldn't have been an attitude era, the WWE as we know it today probably wouldn't exist. So for, for WWE to recognize the NWL, whether I was in it or not, whether I was a part of it or not, didn't really matter to me because I, I was thrilled for my friends and really gratified I guess, flattered that they finally recognize what an influence NWO was and still is to this day on the wrestling industry. Well, I hope that they ask you to induct them because I think that's, that's something. I think for, for a fan, we want to see you there in some capacity. So hopefully when all this is over, you know, you're, you're going to be asked to, to induct I, them. You know what? I would, I would much rather see Vince McMahon do it. I mean, that would be the ultimate. For Vince McMahon, you have to induct <laughs> NWO. Come on. I, that would be the best, wouldn't it? That would be the ultimate acknowledgement of the NWO. I'd rather have Vince do it. Um, do you know what? I think that would, um, that would be one of those moments that would just get viral and shared everywhere if that happened. It, it would yeah. definitely, it, it would be right up there with Vince introducing me as the new general manager on Monday Night Raw. It, it would, I don't know if it would be quite that big um, because right now, you know, the, the end, you know, WWE has more or less embraced the NWO as part of their intellectual, well, it is their intellectual property. They purchased it. But it, it, they, you know, again, they're still producing the merchandise. You know, this past WrestleMania, John Cena, you know, I came yeah. out in his NWO gear as a part of the, the, the Firefly Funhouse, which is just fantastic in my opinion. But um, so they've kind of integrated the NWO into the WWE culture already. So, you know, Vince doing it wouldn't be quite as shocking. But to me personally, come on. 
I'll be honest. <laughs> you kind of just answered one of my questions a little bit earlier because I was going to actually say you were known for, like, for instance, one of the things that you would do is reveal the results of Raw live on Monday Nitro. So you kind of did these things. So do you feel that if it wasn't for you pushing and really kind of testing the WWE, that because they were stale at the time, they were going on with the gimmicks, we had the same thing. If it wasn't for you applying that pressure, would they have changed to, to have no. the Altitude Era? No. No, they would not have. And that's why I, I mean, that's why I said earlier on. In fact, oh, several years ago now, uh, JBL, John Layfield, had a show on the network where he would interview certain people. And JBL invited me on, you know, this is for a WWE show, mind you. WWE Network is still there to this day somewhere. And JBL sat me down to do this interview. And JBL, who worked for the WWE, basically laid it all out and, and said it. You know, if it wasn't for Nitro going head to head with Monday Night Raw, if it wasn't for the NWO, if it wasn't for the kind of pressure that I individually and we as a company put on WWE, there wouldn't be an attitude era. And I think it's safe to say, now I'm, I'm, I'm not objective, my subjective opinion is that if it wouldn't have been for the Monday Night Wars, yeah. thank you. If it wouldn't have been for the NWO, thank you. <laughs> if, if it wouldn't have been for the kind of pressure um, that I put on WWE to change the way they presented their product, there wouldn't have been a Monday Night Wars. The Monday Night Wars elevated the wrestling business to a height that we'll probably never see again in, in terms of viewers and, and, and just passion for the product. You know, you go back to Nitro, you go back to the Monday Night Wars during the peak of it, 97, 98, early 98. On any given Monday night, there were probably, even accounting for duplication in some of these numbers, you know, the same people watching both shows, uh, there were probably no less than eight or nine million people watching wrestling on a Monday night. There's maybe two million now. That's incredible. That's, so that... That success that elevated yeah. awareness across the boards, not only amongst wrestling fans, but amongst television networks that saw this massive audience that was built as a result of, you're welcome, <laughs> um, and, and all the things that we did, allowed WWE, in my opinion, to go public and yeah. become a public company and to be able to grow the business into what we know now as the WWE which is a worldwide media conglomerate and a juggernaut. Um, none of that would have happened had it not been for the Monday Night Wars and the tactics and the strategies and all the changes that came about as a result of it. And I know that sounds, that sounds very egotistical and it, no. I guess might be in some cases. I'm, I'm, not, I'm human. I'm capable of, of having a little too much pride every once in a while. But I think I'm fairly subjective when it comes to just the business dynamics of what that competition really meant and how the WWE was able to leverage that success into even greater success. And at the core of it, it wouldn't have happened had it not been for that head-to-head -head confrontation. And like you said, you know, it's something that would ne never happen before and I doubt it's ever going to happen again. And it was just, everyone was gripped because you never knew what was going to happen. And that aspect for me of wrestling, of the surprise element is gone. I mean, I can kind of predict what's going to happen in, in most storylines now. And back then it was different. And with, for you, it being right at the center of the Monday Night Wars, how did it feel? Was it because it was an element of stress? Was it kind of excitement, adrenaline? What was, how did you feel when you were right in the center of that? Because when you're beating them for months and months and months, that must have just been the, the biggest high of, of, you know, one of your, you know, in your life. Uh, you know, it wasn't in, in many respects, not in all respects, uh, but again, to, I, I'll try to explain it, you know, uh, as best I can. Keep in mind, I was learning on the job. Yeah. I, I, I was put into a position I realistically wasn't qualified for, but I was smart enough to figure out, right? Um, but every day I was learning on the job. I didn't get involved in creative until really after Nitro and really for all intents and purposes, not really until 96. 
because I didn't know anything about creative. A creative is a really weird, you know, it's a different world. And I had no confidence in myself because I'd never done it before. I had a fundamental understanding of storytelling and what I liked as a, as a viewer, but I'd never done it. And I was, I was kind of afraid of it in, in, in all honesty. So I avoided it until I got to the point where I couldn't avoid it. Because in order to make Nitro successful, because I did have that gun to my head, in order to make it successful, the only one I could rely on ultimately was myself. So I threw myself into it to try to learn it. And, and I experimented with it. And some things I did really didn't work. Some things I did are kind of embarrassing and I still see memes of it to this day in my social <laughs> media feed. But a, a lot of the things, some of the things I did were very successful and did work. And that was so exciting because I was learning on the job. Every day was a new challenge. Every day was a new opportunity. Every day was a new frustration. Every day was all of the above. Excitement, um, fear in some respects, uh, anxiety in some respects, uh, all of the above. Every emotion you could probably, feel, almost every emotion you could probably feel, I would go through typically three or four times a day on a daily basis for a couple of years. So it was great. I had a ball. And it's kind of a little bit off topic, but just for this interview so far today, um, what comes across really strongly is a lot of people would get a little bit daunted with certain things, but it's kind of like can't isn't a thing in, in your vocabulary. You've just got this mindset of if you want to do something, you'll go ahead and do it and, and you succeed at it. So where does that drive come from? Is it something that you, you had growing up? Was it drilled into you? Because you've got this kind of can do, will do attitude. It's actually inspiring to, to listen to. Yeah, it is something that's been a part of who I am my entire life from probably from the time I was six or eight years old. You know, my, my, my mother, rest her soul, told me a story uh, before she passed how when I was like five years old, I ran away from home and at five in Detroit. And what I ended up doing, because I had no money, I had no food, was I would go around my neighborhood and I would collect pop bottle caps, or soda bottle caps. And then I would take a big bag of these soda bottle caps and I would go door to door selling them to my neighbors. Well, what, what person, what adult isn't going to give a kid a quarter who comes up to the house and tries to sell him a pop bottle cap, right? <laughs> You're just going to give him a quarter because it's cute. Yeah. Well, that was inspiration. You know, that kind of probably set the tone for me. It's like, okay, I'm five years old. I got no money. I don't have a car. I have no idea where I'm going. I can't even find my way out of my neighborhood. But I know I need money, so I'm going to collect all these pop bottle caps that are laying around, and I'm going to take them door to door until I save up enough money to get on a bus and go to grandma's. <laughs> so that's incredible. You know, you know, that's that was when I was like five or six, and and I do I still have it to this day. I I've learned and I've had to learn because it doesn't always serve me well. You know, once I get passionate about something, or I get an idea in my head, like I don't want anybody to tell me, yeah, but you might want to think about this. Or I always used to take that input as negative. In fact, my dad, who was quite different than me in many respects, in some respects, similar in others, but my dad always used to tell me, Eric, if you want to, if you, if there's something that you want to achieve, before you focus on the outcome, focus on all of the obstacles that are in your way. Overcome those obstacles and you'll get to your destination. That was really good advice from my dad. I hated it. It's like, I'm not going to focus on the negatives. I'll figure it out when I get there. I'm going to focus <laughs> on the positive. And I've learned over the years that my dad's advice is very applicable because even to this day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll find a project that I get excited about. And all I see is the end. And all I really give any consideration to is the outcome. I don't want to hear about the problems. I don't want to spend time and energy dealing with negative things. I'll worry about them when I get there. But oftentimes that's a very bad strategy and approach. So finally, after all these years of banging my head out of rocks and yeah, I've been successful in some things, but yeah, I've really dropped the ball on others. Um, I've kind of figured out a happy medium 
and now I'm approaching things a little bit more like my dad, but with the enthusiasm and passion yeah. that I probably got from my mom. And I mean, you're just talking about obstacles that, that you know come in your life, and one of them, um, well, it was a shock was when your you working with WCW stopped. You know, you were, you were let go. Now, for someone that had changed the company, you made it what it, it wouldn't have been WCW if it wasn't for you. So, what were your feelings towards them for letting you go? Was it was it kind of like how can you do this after everything I've done for you? Or did you understand it from a business standpoint? Uh, neither. I was so angry. And, and again, this would turn into a three hour podcast and I don't have the time for it. Neither do you and your audience will be bored silly. But there was a period of time starting in about July of 90, August of 98, when the Time Warner merger began to really manifest within Turner Broadcasting. It had been announced previously but it, we didn't really see a lot of changes. There wasn't any shift in culture. There wasn't any real shift in the way we were normally doing business. Everything was pretty much the same for the first six months or so. But then slowly and gradually things started to change. The culture really started to change. We went from being, you know, Ted Turner was known. I mean, he's one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our lifetime. He created CNN, he created cable news, he created 24 hour news. He created so many things and was so successful. And that was the culture within Turner Broadcasting. The culture within Time Warner was much more like the culture within a bank or federal government, right? It was very conservative. Uh, they were not entrepreneurs. <clears throat> they were more like bankers and attorneys where we were more like the kid selling pop bottle caps door to door when he was five, right? Yeah. And Ted Turner encouraged, you know, he didn't want anybody to fail, but he encouraged you to think bigger. And it's okay to fail as long as your success and failure rates are well balanced. You know, don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to do th something different because that's how Ted Turner made all of his money and his fortune and built, you know, Turner Broadcasting to become what it was. So there are two kind of polar opposite cultures and once the Time Warner culture began to infiltrate, and it starts real slowly and insidiously, and before you know it, you feel like you're working for a bank. I, I, I saw the handwriting on the wall, and I, did, and I didn't fit in. I knew that wasn't the right environment for me. So I fought it, and I resisted it. While I had a lot of success, because still, when this was all happening, WCW was still kind of a juggernaut. And, you know, I miscalculated, I gambled incorrectly. And eventually, you know, by the time 1999 came around, almost a year later, I, I wanted to leave. I really, really did. I did things and said things to people who were so far up the food chain from me. I, would, I wouldn't do it now, obviously. I've gotten a little smarter and a little wiser and more mature, comes with age. But um, back then it was like, screw it. I'm just going to call yeah. it like I see it. And I don't care who's here. I don't care who I'm saying it to. That's not a good, not a good way to survive in a corporate environment, a sophisticated corporate environment that I was in. And uh, it, so by the time it happened, I was, I was relieved. I knew they weren't going to go anywhere. I, I knew without, not, not that I was having a great deal of success. By the time they let me go, things were really unraveling. But I knew there was no one else that they were going to put in there that was going to fix it. I knew they were going to continue to spiral, and they did till they called me and asked me to come back. And, that, and which, again, only, which only validated what I was thinking when they let me go yeah. in the first place. It was like, great, have at it. Let's see what you got. <laughs> and you know, three months later, okay, what's it going to cost to get you to come back? You know. And and going back, obviously, with what they done, there was a lot of of anger there. But to come back, had it dramatically changed? Because I know it's only you said three months, but without your influence and drive, what, what did it look like going back there? It was worse. And, and, wow. and it wasn't worse necessarily. You know, they brought in Vince Russo, who is a joke. And, they, and once they figured out what a joke he was, which, that's why they called me back, they, actually. But uh, it wasn't even that. It wasn't Vince Russo's fault, really. As a company, Turner Broadcasting as a company, and it wasn't just WCW. There were a lot of divisions at Turner Broadcasting that were kind of being affected in much the same way WCW was as a result of this merger. Uh, but it had gotten sufficiently worse. 
uh, because the politics, the internal politics had gotten more intense. And anytime you have internal corporate politics, it kind of trickles down into every, every other property within the company and there's an uneasiness or worse. And that aspect of things had actually gotten worse wow. uh, by the time I came back. I know you, you attempted to buy um, WCW as well, but it did, it, it did it not go through last minute? What kind of happened with that? Yeah, again, you're asking questions that are very, <laughs> uh, that are requisite of a long story and explanation, so I'll summarize it. <clears throat> but yes, I found a, uh, a venture capital group uh, in New York City that was willing to fund the acquisition. And we went through, I don't know, I think I've said before a year, but it might've been a little less, eight months, nine months, 10 months of due diligence, meaning doing all the homework you need to do, going through all the contracts, going through all the accounting, putting together all the new contracts, all the things that go along with acquiring a property from a company like Turner Broadcasting or Time Warner at that point. And right about that same time, somewhere in that time frame. Not only was there a Time Warner or Turner merger, now AOL was coming in and merging with both, which only exacerbated the kind of issues we were already having, right? Uh, and had been having for well over a year. Um, the, I, I guess, I'm sorry, I forgot where you were going with the question. I went off on a tangent. Uh, no, we were saying, you know, you, you attempted to buy WCW, but it didn't. Okay, okay, that's yeah. right, that's right. So going back to what I was stating earlier, where things had gotten progressively worse, I initially approached Turner Broadcasting, Brad Siegel in particular, uh, who was the president of TNT, and I had a good relationship with Brad. I said, Brad, why don't you let me try to put together a team of people that would buy this from Turner? Because you guys don't really want it. Nobody with an AOL Time Warner really wants WCW. So if you don't really want it, why don't you let me buy it before it craters in value even more than it already has? Well, Brad Single kind of laughed at me. And, you know, through a couple months went by and situations happened. And Brad called me and said, <clears throat> Eric, uh, you know, you said you thought you might have somebody that would be willing to buy WCW. Is that still the case? I said, yes, Brad, it is. Why don't we revisit that? And I said, Okay. And I did. We put the deal together and spent about six or eight months doing due diligence, all the other things I talked about. We were, very, we were within, I mean, the, the deal was announced. We did a Wall Street conference call announcing it to investors, right? We went very public with Turner Broadcasting executives as well as executives with myself and others uh, that came together to make the acquisition. So we stepped out there in public, announced it, did the whole nine yards. And shortly before the deal was to close, I had uh, taken my wife and my kids during spring break uh, to Hawaii because I knew that once we acquired WCW, my life was going to, once again, I was going to be back to working 20 hours a day, seven days a week and traveling all over the world. I knew that. So I wanted to take advantage of this one week window I had to take my kids, my family on a really nice vacation. <clears throat> so we went to Hawaii and I was sitting on a beach and I'm having a beach drink in the middle of the afternoon. And I got a phone call from my partner at the time, Brian Badal. And uh, he said, uh, Eric, uh, it's over. And I'm thinking, great, let's get another drink. You know, I was ready to celebrate. And he said, no, you don't understand. It's over. I said, no, I get it. It's done. We're, we're close. He goes, no. Yeah. Jamie Kellner, who was an executive brought in by AOL, I believe, or Time Warner, one or the other, can't remember now, <clears throat> came in to take over both TNT and TBS and said, kill that deal that we'd already announced, that we'd spent eight months doing due diligence on, probably close to a million dollars in legal fees. Kill that deal. We no longer want to do that deal because that deal originally, as it was originally conceived, provided us with a television opportunity on TNT and TBS. And Jamie Kellner did not want wrestling on the network. Anybody's wrestling. He didn't want WWF. <clears throat> he didn't want WCW. He wanted to do movies and comedies. All right. So once they took the television component out of the deal, there was really no value to the deal. 
and it went away. And then I know in wrestling they say never say never, but this what I'm about to go on to is just unimaginable. It's one of those things you would never in your wildest dreams think would happen. And that's Vince McMahon standing on the ramp and then saying, your new general manager, your music hits and then you walk out. And I've never to this day heard a reaction from the crowd like you got because people were just, the commentators, everybody were, were so surprised. So what, how did that happen? Did, did he contact you um, to, to get you on board? Yeah, I had, uh, you know, I was pretty sure that wrestling was no, you know, in my rearview mirror, yeah. so to speak. And I was pursuing <clears throat> my own television production company and, and having some success doing it. Uh, but I had, you know, Kevin Nash, who's, a, you know, remained a close friend, was working at WWE at the time. And he said, hey, Eric, you know, I'm just going to give you a heads up. Don't be surprised based on some of the chatter that I'm hearing in WWE. Don't be surprised if you don't get a call from Vince McMahon. Oh, what? <laughs> Why would Vince McMahon call me? Because this, yeah, there's some talk about maybe bringing you in to do something. Oh, okay, well, we'll see if that happens. And literally the next day, Vince called me, and uh, we had a very nice chat. And probably within five minutes of that chat, I had made up my mind that I wanted to go to work for him. <clears throat> it was a good opportunity for me. And uh, the rest is history. But obviously with so much history there in regards to the, the, the war, the ratings war, I know that you've said that, you know, stuff about each other in the past. Did it surprise you that he kind of reached out to you and said, you know, look, I, I want you on board. W would you have done the same thing if he, if um, they had lost the, the rate of battle and you had got on top? Would you have done the same? That's an amazing question that you just asked because that was the first question that Vince Mc, first thing that Vince McMahon said to me it wasn't a question. Like literally to lead off the call, he said, Eric, I would like to think that if things would have been reversed, that at some point you'd reach out to me and give me an opportunity to get back in the business. I said, damn, that is such a nice thing to say. And it's so elegant. Yeah. It's such a classy thing to, for him to say to me that immediately I went, oh, man, of course <laughs> I'll come to work for you. Um, look, I, I don't I, – I, I, I always make it known I, I, I don't like hypothetical questions because there's never an honest or accurate answer. It's a hypothetical. Who knows what one would yeah. do given a set of circumstances that didn't ever exist? I don't know. I would like to think I would. Yeah. I like to think I'm a big enough person and a smart enough person to take advantage of that opportunity that that hypothetical situation would have created. I like to think I would. But there's a chance I wouldn't have. I don't know. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall backstage where you're walking through the WWE arena and, and some of the wrestlers that had worked with you in WCW kind of seeing you there. They must have been thinking, what's going on? What's Eric doing here? That must have been fun in a way for you to have that kind of mysteriousness about the whole reason you're there. Uh, people were genuinely shocked. And, and yeah. there were some people that were shocked and angry. There were others that were probably shocked and a little nervous um, because they didn't know, you know, what my role really was. You know, was I coming in just as a character or was I coming in as something more than a character? Would, if I was coming in as something more than a character, was that somehow going to affect them because they felt like I was resentful towards them? So, I mean, <clears throat> it was all a figment of their imagination because they didn't know. And oftentimes people yeah. fear what they don't know more than what they do know. So there was a little bit of that. Um, there were some people that were probably, you know, secretly a little tickled because it was so, you know, unexpected and ironic. Um, but yeah, it was a blast. I'm not going to deny it. You don't have to say, I mean, who, you said some people were angry. Who were those people? Would you prefer not to, to say? Oh, I'll let that go. It's water, <laughs> under the, it's water under the bridge. It doesn't really add to the story. Do you know what I loved about you in WWE? It was a different Eric Bischoff because you, you, it just felt, and I guess for you, you had all the stress and everything that was going bad at the time in WCW um, in the later years. This was a chance for you to come on screen, 
without that stress, without the worries, and just be you, that entertainer, the guy that can talk on the mic, the guy that has the ability to wind up a crowd. So did you feel it was a fresh start and a chance for you to enjoy wrestling again? Yeah, you're really good at this, brother, just so you know. You know, Thank one you. of the reasons one of the reasons why it was so easy for me to <clears throat> say yes to, to Vince on that initial call was because when I, when I hung up the phone, number one, I had a really good feeling about Vince. You know, he's a – when Vince McMahon wants to be, um, he can be the most charming individual you'd ever want to – he will make you feel – as good as anybody can make make you feel if he wants you to go along with something that he has in mind. He's a, you know, as the, you know, jokingly referred to, he is the, if you Google silver tongue devil, Vince McMahon's picture will come up. He's great. But when I hung up the phone, I thought about it for a minute and I thought, wow, what an amazing opportunity for me <clears throat> to, end my career in wrestling as a character because my 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 leg I, I hate to say legacy my my reputation you know once i left wcw or was let go by wcw i came back to wcw and that didn't work out for a lot of reasons um i tried to buy wcw that didn't work out my my history within the wrestling industry was kind of that's so a great right? Wasn't, wasn't a legacy that I wanted to, it's not the way I wanted to end my movie. Let's put it that way. Yeah. If I was going to make a wrestling movie in my life, it wouldn't have ended like that. And here was an opportunity. And this is, I, it actually was a thought process that I, that I had. I remember having it and because I, I talked to my wife about it afterwards, after the call, I said, you know, why am I going to do this? I'm going to do this because number one, not to sound like a full of myself, but I've, I've always known I'm a good character. It comes very naturally for me. I'm very comfortable doing it. I don't have to work at it too hard. I can adapt to different situations and I feel very, it's easy for me without yeah. saying too much more. So I, I had a lot of confidence in my own abilities. I knew that I'd be working with a lot of talent that I had never worked with before in WWE. I knew that WWE was the largest stage in the world. So as a performer, which a large part of me is, um, what what better opportunity is there than that, you know? Um, and more importantly, and what affected my, the decision I had already made really, um, was that I knew that whether I spent six months there or a year, I never thought it would last more than a year, honestly. I think I saved four or five or whatever. Um, but I thought, you know, it, no matter how long it lasts, it's a way for me to end my movie the way I want to end my movie. Because I knew as my role as an on-camera character, because of the confidence I had in myself and the opportunity that WWE provided, I knew it was gonna end up positive. And that's what I really wanted out of it. You know, the money's always nice, I'm not gonna deny that. But more than the money was the opportunity to end my movie the way I wanted to end my movie. And you had so many funny moments. A lot of your storylines were comedy based. And of course, Billy and Chuck's wedding <laughs> coming out of the hands moving and everyone, you took it off and no one could believe um, what was going on. And I, I know that that day you came up in, um, I don't know if it's true, but you came up in the, the costume. You were with Vince. You came in his car. Was that correct on, on the day of the filming? No, 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 no. What had happened, with, with, and you're talking about the scene where I played the uh, the minister. Yeah. Where I was m marrying. Uh, Billy and Chuck. Billy and Jack, <laughs> yeah. Billy and Chuck. Uh, yeah, that was, they came up with it. They, you know, I'm guessing it was Brian Gewertz, who was a great writer for WWE. Now he's working with The Rock and Rock's production company, Seven Bucks Productions. Brian was a really, really talented guy. And I'm assuming, I don't know the detail. I don't know who came up with that idea, but I'm going to, for this conversation, I'm going to assume Brian had a lot to do with it. Uh, they had obviously worked on that quite a ways ahead of time because it involved me weeks before that scene that we did live. I had to fly out to uh, Hollywood and get fitted for that rubber mask <clears throat> by a special effects company that did a lot of similar work for a lot of you know, top feature films. So it was a long process of making that 
that mass so that it looked as real as it did. So I flew out to LA, I got fitted, they did all the things I needed to do. And then when it came to actually produce or the day of, or, yeah, the day of that show, uh, it was in Minneapolis. I actually had to get to the arena way ahead of time <clears throat> because they wanted to start getting me fitted for that mask and get it <laughs> on me before anybody came in. Because Vince, or Stu Vince McMahon in WWE, didn't want anybody to know it was me. They wanted to capitalize on the surprise. Well, if on the internet, everybody's talking about, oh, Eric Bischoff's running around in makeup as an old man, he's gonna be the minister, it would have diluted the impact yeah. of that scene. So I, I drove myself to the arena probably four hours before I was needed to be there, before anybody else, started getting fitted. So by the time everybody started showing up, I was already in full makeup. Uh, and, I, and I walked around all afternoon trying to become that character, <clears throat> which was a combination the character really was uh, partly my father, you know, the hand shaking and the way I was carrying my fingers. My dad was paralyzed as a, in his 20s as a result of a botched spinal slash brain injury or brain surgery. Okay. And his hands were kind of curled and would shake a little bit like that. And the other part of that character was from somebody within the wrestling world that some people know, many people have forgotten about, like a guy by the name of Jim Barnett. And Jim Barnett was an old promoter and been around for a long time. And he always had this voice. He's kind of like, <laughs> my boy, your shoes look marvelous today. Let's do lunch, shall we? And so I kind of combined the physical kind of things that I grew up with or watched my dad go through with that kind of Jim Barnett yeah. influence. And that's, that's the minister that you saw. But I had a blast with that. That was a lot of fun. And you had the ability, um, I, it's just, I guess you as a person, but to have chemistry with whoever you worked with, like the stories of Steve Austin, Steph McMahon, John Cena, you just had an ability to make everything look good. So what was it like working with, say, you know, Steve Austin and, and, and Stephanie McMahon? Well, Steve especially was great. You know, that was probably the highlight of my time in not not probably without question the highlight of my time in wwe as as a performer yeah. and you know number one steve and i are very similar believe it or not we like the same things we have the kind of same in many respects philosophy on life he likes to hunt and fish i like to hunt and fish i like living in a country he likes living in a country we both like the same type of music for the most part he likes beer. I like beer. There's so many parallels to us, yeah. although we're quite different in many respects. We're very similar in others. Um, but more importantly than that, there was seven or eight years of backstory going back to why the NWO worked. Why did the NWO work? Because the story of Scott Hall and Kevin Nash leaving WCW, going to WWE, becoming big stars, and coming back to exact revenge on, revenge on the people that didn't give them the respect they deserved the first time around. That was a very believable story. Likewise, Steve Austin and I had this built-in backstory because I fired him by FedEx. And he, <laughs> went on to, and he went on to use that fact, you know, to help promote himself and get himself over in ECW. It yeah. became kind of a, a, a legacy, if you will, or a just kind of the the common knowledge within the wrestling community which had now because of the internet had gotten so much bigger in social media or the internet community back then before twitter facebook uh, but there was this huge awareness of this i fired steve austin and i did it by fedex so that that premise of us two coming to or the storyline of, of us two coming together and the backstory that was the foundation of it that movie writes itself. Yeah, you, you, you get out a get out a crayon and a piece of paper, and you, anybody can figure that story out. It was it was already written, and which just made it that much more fun. Now, add to the fact that Steve Austin was such a massively powerful character with such a huge following as a babyface. I was doing all right as a heel, so now you've got all of the elements. All you have to do is not screw it up. And, and we, we didn't screw it up because we just had fun with it. And we had the latitude to do what we wanted to do. Well, let me take that back. Steve had the latitude to do what <laughs> Steve wanted to do. All I had to do 
was follow the leader. You know, it's like a dance. You know, Steve was a great dancer. All I had to do was just go along with it, and make, and, and he'd make it all look good. And you know, it was it was so easy, and we had so much fun. So with you know, you were by then um, a character so popular with with the audience. So how did it come about? You actually leaving WWE? Did they come to you and say, look, we're we're terminating your contract? How did that actually happen? Because I, I was gutted because I felt we could, they could have done more with you. It was just so entertaining. I, I felt the opposite. Um, right. it, it, I got a call from Stephanie, who was in charge at the time. I was at home. At, I, at the time, I had a home in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, Stephanie said, hey, Eric, I just want to let you know um, we're, we're not going to be using you anymore on TV. And I still had time left on my contract, I don't know, four or five months or whatever it was. She said, don't worry. You know, we're going we're gonna to fulfill the, our agreement with you. No hard feelings. It's just that you know, we're going to go in another direction. And I, I was kind of relieved because as a character, as a performer, I, I recognized that every week I was kind of doing a different version of the same thing. Right. You know, and that, that's partly because as, a, as an authority figure, as a heel authority figure, you start to run out of shit to do. Yeah. It just doesn't feel fresh anymore. And it, no matter what you do, it's kind of like, oh, that's, oh, that's just like they did that. They, well, they did that a couple months ago. So I was finding it harder and harder to really feel excited about. I, you know, I was able to do it. And yeah. Hopefully people didn't realize I wasn't quite as excited about it as I previously had been, you know, years before, a couple years before when it was all fresh and new. But I knew, I knew as the guy in the ring I could sense the audience going, okay, this again. Okay, great. Yeah, we, we like it. We liked it last time. We still, we don't like it quite as much, but it's, it's pretty good. And when you, when you feel that, you, you begin to realize that, all right, we've done it all. There's really no more to go. There's nowhere else to go with it. And again, I was so focused on ending on a high note. I really wanted to end on a high note, which is why, if you go back and watch my last appearance as a talent in WWE, when they sent me the scene, the way they laid it out, that they, you know, they wanted me in the ring with John Cena, and John Cena was going to hit me with the FU or whatever it was, <clears throat> and John Cena was originally supposed to pick me up and throw me in a garbage truck. I went, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. If this is really my last, you know, appearance in WWE, let's go all the way back to the beginning and give the audience what they really want to see. Eric Bischoff versus Vince McMahon. Let's have wow. Vince McMahon throw me in the garbage truck. So I literally, I, you know, and I didn't try to change creative maybe a handful of times the whole time I was there. Most of those times they were little tweaks, you know, minor little things. Yeah. This was a bigger thing. Um, I went back and, and pitched it to Vince and told them why, and they changed it. Because I knew that was the best way for me to go off TV. That, that, would, that would have the most impact. It would satisfy the audience the most just because of the inherent nature of our previous relationship. And it, it would have filled in all of the blanks that up until that point hadn't been filled in, which is why did Vince McMahon actually bring me in? Well, he brought me in to be this ruthless aggression type of general manager. I didn't get the job done in his opinion. So he threw me in a garbage truck. That's an easy enough story to understand as opposed to having John Cena do it. So. Yeah, and I guess that, that kind of with the point that I made earlier shows how much fun you were having being the character because to actually come forward and say that a lot of people wouldn't they wouldn't want to have had that storyline happen being chucked in the the trash by the guy that beat them in a rate you know in the the company wall but for you to do that I think just shows how much fun you were having and kind of this was your chance to to enjoy it again you know as opposed to having the stress so after this all happened. Um, did you think wrestling was over for you? Yeah, you know, and, and that's probably why, you know, I didn't come up with the saying never say never, but whoever came up with it, I, I used the hell out of it. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm now on, you know, I thought wrestling was in my rear view mirror in 1999 when I got let go by Turner the first time. I thought wrestling was in my rear view mirror after we failed to acquire WCW in 2000. I thought, w, I thought wrestling was in my rear view mirror 
uh, in 2005 or seven or whatever it was when I left, I think it was 2005, when I left WWE as a talent, when I got thrown in a garbage truck. I thought it was over then. And then I thought it was over when I left TNA. And then I thought it was over, <laughs> I thought, I think it's over now that I've been let go by WWE as an executive. But I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna believe it. Cause you know, you just, you never know, you know, it's, Things change, people change, opportunities change, conditions change. So I think wrestling's in my rearview mirror. You but never know. As long as I'm still drawing breath, there's always that you know chance something could change. I guess. With with TNA, um, was that a that kind of period of time for you? Do you have fond memories, or is that a chapter that you kind of wish didn't happen? You know, it's both. You know, um, I just did a podcast about. My experience uh, actually two of them uh on 83 weeks so rather than go into it again I i'll say a couple things on that you know one is i wasn't really excited about going into tna in the first place because i really didn't want to get back in the wrestling business at that point in my life i had my own production company along with my partner we were hugely successful as independent television producers i was making more money than i had ever made in my life i didn't need wrestling i didn't need the money uh but for a couple other reasons that you could learn about on the podcast, I decided to, to, to go forward with it. And um, initially it was just, I was fulfilling, not an obligation, but I was fulfilling a responsibility that I felt I had for some reason. Uh, and it got to be more fun. And then when I got to, you know, bring my son into the business, because that was always a big goal of his and a dream of yeah. his to work with me in the wrestling business. And I got to be able to make that dream of his come true. So as a father, uh, man, what can be better than that? You know, making yeah. your kid's dream come true, creating an opportunity for, you know, your children. As a father, as a human being, there is no greater reward in life than that to me personally. So I'm always going to be grateful for that. But overall, it was you know, more frustration than not, because it was such a great opportunity. Had things been different, you know, philosophies been different and probably different people involved in different positions, it would still be here today uh, yeah. on Paramount TV, but you know, whatever, I don't, I'll dwell on it. And my, the last thing I want to ask you, because you've been so generous with your time is, Obviously, you mentioned last year you were brought back by the WWE um, in an executive role for SmackDown. Now, I, it was the moment for me, because I'm going to be completely honest, there was a stage where I was losing interest in watching the product. It just didn't feel like it used to for me. And when that announcement was made, I was excited because I thought, here's a guy that's got a record. He knows what he's doing. He's going to go in this role and smash it. He's going to make it good again. Um, and... All of a sudden, within a few months, we find out that you're no longer there and they, they brought someone else in. It's kind of like, you know, wh why has that happened? So if, if you're okay with it, talk us through what happened. You know, why aren't you there? Why was it a short stint? Because it kind of didn't feel like you had time to do what you needed to. Well, it's a little, it, it's very complex. Um, I think a lot of it had, to, look, I'll start, I'll, I'll give you the end of the conversation and then I'll back up a little bit. It was my responsibility. You know, I didn't adapt. Um, I, I overestimated, overestimated my ability to adapt to almost any situation, which I've, for the most part throughout my life, I've been pretty good at, but I overestimated my own abilities to adapt to the WWE culture and environment. I underestimated just how big of a challenge becoming integrated into that culture and environment and process really was. I had no idea, right? So I'm overest overestimating my own ability to adapt to almost anything while underestimating that which I have to adapt to. Yeah. And I, when I got there, I, I kind of, I got to be a little careful what I say here, out of respect, no other reason than respect. <clears throat> because I still consider Vince McMahon a friend. I have probably more friends within WWE than I have outside of WWE. So yeah. when I'm cautious, it's not for any other reason. But I probably went into it without considering 
I wasn't worried about anything. I wasn't, I just went into it like I go into everything else. You know, yeah. Figure it out when I get there, you know? Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't listen to my father's voice and say, okay, what are the obstacles going to be along the way? Right? <laughs> I didn't do that. Dad, I'm sorry, you were right, you were always right. <laughs> Measure twice, cut once, I get it, you're always right. But um, I didn't do any of that. You know, the opportunity came up and Bruce Pritchard, who's one of my best friends, had already been with, back to WWE for several months and he called me and said, hey, would, would it be all right with you if I bring your name up to Vince because there's a role here that I think you could fill. I said, sure, you know, of course. Not really thinking anything would come of it. And then shortly thereafter, Bruce called me back and said, are you ready to go back to work? I went, well, this is exciting, of course. <laughs> I flew out, you know, I had a couple meetings, and before I knew it, I, was, I made a commitment, and I was packing my bags to move to Stanford, Connecticut. And once I got there, I realized just how challenging it was going to be for me to adapt to that culture into those processes. It was very unique and it was very unique, right? I went into it thinking that I would have the latitude or the ability to change things. Yeah. The reality wasn't what in my mind I expected or hoped I thought it was going to be. And I tried to adapt, I really did. And it was a massive opportunity. And WWE provided me with every opportunity to succeed. I, I don't wanna make it sound, I mean, they did everything they could do. Yeah. I just wasn't capable of adapting my character, my personality, my thought processes, um, my way of doing business. It just was a square peg in a round hole. There was nothing wrong with a square peg. In fact, the square peg being WWE, it was a very successful square peg, the most successful square peg in the history of professional wrestling. My round hole was pretty successful and had a lot of things that it could contribute, but it's just kind of like a bad relationship. You know, no matter how hard both parties try, it's just not really going to work. Yeah. And that's about the best way I could describe it. Now, um, I'd like you to tell people where we can listen to the podcast because talking today, I'm already wanting to know so much more. Um, so tell us about the podcast, where we can we can listen to it too, and any other kind of projects you're working on. Oh, well, as far as the podcast goes, uh, the name of the podcast is 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. And you can get, you know, just search 83 Weeks, you know, yeah. anywhere you get your favorite podcast and you'll find us. Hit the subscribe button and we put out about two and a half or three hour show uh, each and every week. Uh, and it essentially talks about the Monday Night War era, and we talk a little bit about TNA, and we talk a little bit about my time in WWE. But for the most part, we just about everything we talk about is kind of centric within that whole Monday Night War era, and all the things that came out of it, and some of it that we see to this day. Um, we also have some great content on a Patreon platform, and it's all fresh content, and it's unique content, exclusive. And you can go to adfreeshows.com. Myself, Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross, Arn Anderson, Bruce Pritchard, all of our podcasts with Conrad Thompson are available on that platform. And you get them early and you get them without any commercials because we get a lot of commercials. These are very successful shows. So you can get them early and you get them ad free. Plus, there's a ton of really cool bonus content. And we all kind of create our own content and submit it. And the only place you can get it is on adfreeshows.com. <clears throat> if you want to reach out and touch me on Twitter, it's at ebischoff. And that's about it, bro. Well, Eric, I've got to say, for me, um, I, I'll never forget this opportunity that you've given me to interview you and just go on this journey throughout your career and get an idea of the type of man you are who never gives up, who fights for everything. And it, it's been inspiring talking to you today. And I'm so you know, so happy that you've given me the chance to, to interview you today. Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. I'm looking forward to getting back to the UK sometime yeah. <laughs> uh, in the near future, hopefully sooner than later. I, I love co coming. UK fans are the best. And I'm not saying that to be yeah. you know, patronizing, but I, I get to go back to the UK quite often. 
Uh, and I absolutely love it. I've been there with Inside the Ropes, Kenny McIntosh yeah. a couple times, and, or at least once. And we've traveled around you know, Ireland, Scotland, England. We, we just love it. And um, I can't wait to come back. You know, I, I love the, the fans in the UK are, <clears throat> they're different than US fans. I, I, don't wanna, I don't like comparing them, but there's something about UK fans, um, I guess because they don't get a lot of, you know, a lot of us don't come over on a regular basis. So when we do, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, here in the U.S., they're kind of, you know, yeah, there they are again. Oh, yeah, I saw them three months ago. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> I, the energy is really good, and the beer is fantastic. And there is better Indian food in the U.K. than there is in India, which is a big deal for me. Uh, so, yeah, I can't wait to come back. Well, thank you so much for giving me your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right, my man. Be well. Thanks.